Hello and welcome to another Physics 1401 video. Today I'm going to talk about applying the application of Newton's uh, laws with constant acceleration kinematics. And after that I'm going to move on to uh, projectile motion, which is also a case for uh, constant acceleration kinematics. Now in the previous video uh, I talked about how to derive the uh, constant acceleration kinematics equations. So if you haven't watched that video yet, please do so. Watch it before you watch this video. Now uh, we started with uh, Newton's laws and then moved on to the kinematics. Now Newton's laws, say the second law, is uh, a universal law pretty generic. Now let's remember what the second law was. Uh, the net force acting on an object which is by definition the vector sum of all forces, all external forces let's say, okay, is equal to its mass times its acceleration where F net, okay, it's very important, you never use only one force you have to consider all of the external forces. So we're talking about a vector sum. Let's use this uh, sigma symbol uh, to denote the summation. Let's say you have n number of forces. So I'm just adding them up. This i represents the ith uh, element, ith force, right? So this a here is the instantaneous acceleration, okay? So this equation is not restricted to constant acceleration, right? A, in the most generic sense, is a function of time, which means F net is also uh, subject to change with time in general, okay? And actually, most of the cases uh, you can think of is like that, where you have a changing acceleration because of the changing force. Imagine the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Okay? For instance, let's say example, the force between the gravitational attraction between uh, the Earth and the Sun, which is given by this formula, if you remember, large M represents the Sun's uh, mass and little m, okay, capital M, sun's mass, the m, Earth's mass, and uh, this r here in the denominator is the distance between the center of mass of each object, okay? So this gives you the force between the, uh, the, the, the objects, but as we know, um, Earth's orbit around the sun is not a perfect circle. A perfect circle would mean constant distance from the center, right? Which would be the radius. But in reality, it is an ellipse. I'm going to exaggerate a little bit. I mean, Earth's orbit is very close to a uh, circle, but it's not a perfect circle, which means that the distance between the Sun and the Earth changes over the year, okay? So, <coughs> if R changes, since the masses and the gravitational constants are constants, force depends on distance. And if the distance changes in time, this means force changes in time as well. In return, the acceleration also changes. Just one example, okay? Now, do we have to worry about this when we're playing baseball? No, not really, because when you're doing that, you're not really launching a rocket, right? You're just throwing a ball and within, you know, 100 yards or so, or even more actually, uh, the gravity of Earth does not change. You can, I mean, you can use approximation, that approximation that the gravitational forces between the ball and the Earth doesn't change that much. Like mg, we use the uh, weight formula, mg, Right, uh, where we take g as 9.8 meters per second square. So this is the uh, laboratory frame, if you will, or 
everyday uh, um, observations of uh, objects falling or th you're throwing a ball, these all fall into that category where gravity is assumed to be constant. But once you start uh, launching rockets or ICBMs, right, intercontinental ballistic missile, now think about what's going to happen. You're here. This globe is the Earth. Okay, here's you are, and this is your uh, target, and you're going to launch a a missile. Now this missile is not like the baseball, right? It has to go a lot of distance all the way to the target to hit the target like this. Now, as you can see, that green path is not really a circle anymore, right? And it's actually an elliptic curve, just like the Earth going around the sun. That missile from the launching point till the point it hits the target is going to follow an elliptic path on which the gravitational forces are not constant because you're really far, okay? I mean, these missiles have to go really high altitudes. Therefore, gravity will not be constant anymore and you can't use that approximation, which is mg, anymore. Okay? Just one example. Um, what if you're hitting a football, a football field? Okay, let me just try to draw it nicely. Here's the football field, right? And you kick a football here. Now, this is not as uh, long as the interconnected, I mean, the ICBM's path. So within this um, small distances, you can assume that gravity is pretty much constant. And it's always downward, right? Now, in the case of the, uh, of the ballistic missile, Gravity was pointing to the center of the Earth. Wherever you are, gravity points A, that's what I'm talking about, the acceleration due to gravity, points to the center of the Earth, roughly, right? But here, for this problem of throwing a football, kicking a football, since we're talking about a really small area, Earth is almost flat within that scale, right? So G, or A, is downward, and the path is no longer elliptic. We call it a parabolic path. I'm going to explain a little bit when we get to projectile motion. But for such approximations or such problems, we can use constant acceleration. Okay? So, whether A changes in time or not, Newton's law, Newton's second law, is still valid. It's generic. Okay? It has nothing to do with how your variables change or not change, don't change in time. It's a generic equation. So let's focus on only constant acceleration for a while. And let's try to apply this second law to problems. Okay? And this problem, these problems uh, may be a little bit more complicated. For instance, in this formula, we have only one mass here, m. What if we, are, we have two masses, like two masses connected with a rope, for instance, okay? So let's, let's try that. Let's take two masses and let's put them on a table. These masses are connected with a rope. And then we have a, another rope on the right-hand side. And let this rope go over a pulley. And then let's pull this downward. Okay, so this is actually a tabletop. And this pulley <clears throat> is attached to the edge of the tabletop here, like this. Now the surface of the table may or may not have friction in real life of course it has friction um, but you may have a problem where you can ignore friction depending on the pulley's function here is to change the direction of the force instead of pulling the system horizontally 
using the rope and the pulley, you can actually pull the rope at any angle. At any angle, in this case, downward. Okay? But there's this force here. What do we call the forces in ropes? Tension, right? Tension force. So there is this T here. All right. Now, what happens at the pulley? Now, the pulley has to rotate. So, there must be a friction between the rope and the pulley. Okay? Since you already know what types of friction are there, like static and kinetic, we're talking about actually a static type of friction here. Okay? Because uh, the, the, the rope doesn't rub against the pulley. It rotates the pulley, okay? Um, so it is static type of friction. Now, in order to be able to rotate the pulley, the tension here on the side of the rope, which you're holding on, has to be a little greater than the tension on the other side. Okay, that's real life. But we're not going to take that into account for now all right that's actually a later topic when we do rotational dynamics we have to include what's happening at the pulley in detail but for today's purposes let's ignore that okay which means we're talking about a massless and frictionless pulley If it is massless, okay, we can assume that the tension on this part of the rope is equal to the tension on that part of the rope. So it's the same T. Not to say the T in the middle is the same. No, that has nothing to do with the pulley. Okay, the, the, the string between the masses does have a tension in it, but that tension is different from the tension I'm talking about. So let's call this T here. And this one, I don't know, T prime, all right? They are different. All right? Now, so later when we do uh, pulleys with mass, we're going to include that. Uh, that's when the tension here will not be equal to the tension you pull it with, the force you pull the rope with, okay? Because some of that tension will be used to rotate the pulley, which we're ignoring for now. All right, so those are tensions, and uh, of course we have the uh, the weight of the masses. Let's include them. So this is m1, this is m2. Therefore, we have the weights, which always point downward. Earth is pulling them downward, right? M2, g. So m1 and m2 press against the table. In return, the table has to push them up. This is Newton's third law, right? The reaction pairs. There's action and reaction. So the reaction is what we call the uh, normal force. So the normal forces are not equal either. So Fn1 and Fn2. Okay, but remember, Fn1 and M1G do not form the pair, interaction pair we have here, okay? Fn1 has a counterpart, which is M1, the force M1 pushes the table downward with, which I didn't show here. I only showed M1G, that's Earth pulling M1 down, okay? In return, M1 pulls Earth up as well, which I didn't show either. So please, um, Realize that F, the normal forces, and the weights do not form the uh, interaction pairs here. When I say action and reaction in Newton's third law, I'm talking about forces which are opposite in direction and equal in magnitude, but also act on different objects. These arrows are attached to the same object, whether M1 or M2. Okay? So keep that in mind. What else? Well, we have friction, I said, so let's include the friction as well. Now, if the system is moving to the right, 
This means the friction forces should point to the left. Little f stands for friction, and these two are in motion, therefore kinetic friction, okay, Fk. And then you have another one here. These two are not the same, so I'm going to call this one Fk2, and this one Fk1. All right, so this pretty much summarizes um, all the forces acting on the objects. It looks like uh, each object here are, is under the influence of four forces. The friction force, tension, whether it's T1, I mean T prime or T, and the weights and the normal forces. All right. So, I mean, uh, once you locate all the forces here, uh, you can draw free body diagrams but this actually does have the, fun the, the forces already pictured here, so I'm not going to draw a free body diagram again. Um, but I'm just going to put the acceleration vector here as an arrow pointing to the right. Okay. Now, if you want to write the free body diagram, if you want to draw the free body diagram separately, you have to do two of them because you have to isolate M1 and M2. But the forces that will go into the free body diagrams are the ones that I just showed you, okay? So to save time, let me not uh, draw that. Then we move on to the last step of writing down Newton's second law, okay? Net force equal to mass times acceleration. Since we have two objects, we have to apply this twice, all right? We apply it twice, and each time we may consider uh, two directions. It's a vector equation. Vectors have components along the x and y directions. Therefore, each equation is actually two equations, okay? So one equation for m1 and one equation for m2, but those equations, f equals ma, also have two components, so we end up with four equations, okay? So this leads to four equations. Now, not in every problem, you may need to use all four equations, all right? Especially <coughs> the ones, um, say, that doesn't have any friction, for instance, okay? You may not have to worry about uh, the normal force you may not have to worry about finding the normal force, for instance. But for today, since I showed all the forces here, why not? Let me, not, let me write down all four equations for you, okay? So, the directions are x and y, all right? So, x is, let's say, to the right, and y, or positive y, is upward, okay? And that's the most obvious, uh, simple choice. But any x and y, as long as they're perpendicular, work, okay? Uh, that's totally up to you. So, look at M1 now, for M1. In the x direction, I have T prime, right? T prime to the right, therefore, goes with a positive sign, T prime. But in the negative direction, or negative x direction, which is to the left, I have the friction force, so it's negative Fk1. All right? So that is the x component of the net force. Net force is, by definition, the sum, right? The net force. The x component of the net force is T prime minus Fk1 for M1 which has to be equal to mass times acceleration. Which mass? M1. M1 times acceleration. Now, acceleration is a vector, but it's already pointing along the x direction. So its y component is zero. So A is, if you remember the vector notation, actually A times the unit vector, if you will, right, in that direction. I'm just gonna call it A. So A is the magnitude of the vector A. Okay, 
So A will be a positive number. That's it. For M1, along the X direction, you have this equation that is Newton's second law. This is from the X direction. This is from the X direction. What about the Y direction? Now, in the Y direction, in the positive Y direction, we have the normal force, Fn1, and its weight, M1g, is pointing downward, therefore it's negative, M1g. Now, equals M1 times acceleration, the Y component of the acceleration, which is zero, right? So this is nothing but AX. AY is zero. So there's nothing here. It's just zero. All right. Now, these are the two equations you get from X and Y directions. But keep in mind, we do have a formula for the friction force, FK1. FK1 is a constant force. It doesn't depend on the speed, right? It doesn't depend on anything. It depends on the direction of the velocity, of course, but magnitude-wise, it only depends on the normal force. And, of course, the material these are made of, therefore, a uh, friction coefficient, or coefficient of kinetic friction, mu k, is involved here. So, mu k times the normal force, Fn1. Okay, so we have three equations already. But let's go back to Newton's second law for M2 now. For M2, what do we have? Again, I'm applying Newton's second law. I have to look at the net forces. The net forces in the X and Y directions, or the XY components of the net force. Now, let's start with X again. What do we have? We have T and we have T prime, right? T pointing to the right, T prime pointing to the left. But we also have FK2, which is also pointing to the left, so minus FK2. That is the net force <coughs> in the X direction, which has to be equal to mass. Which mass? M2. M2 times A. Now, if the rope between the masses is not elastic, just regular rope or chain, something rigid in a way, right? Which doesn't stretch. If that's the case, which is M1 and M2 move together as if glued together, right? So they have the same acceleration. So I'm not going to say A2, it's just A, same A. There's only one A, okay? All right, so that's the X equation and the Y component of the net force. Similar to M1, we have Fn2, second mass, minus M2g equals, again, there is no acceleration in the Y direction. That component is zero, therefore zero. And similarly, the friction force Fk2 is given by mu k times f n 2. All right. So, I mean, I ended up with uh, six equations, but there are really four that are coming from Newton's second law. The friction is just a definition. I can take that and those f k 1 and f k 2 and plug them in the first equations in the x direction, and I have my four equations. Okay? And I could use the y equations to solve for the normal forces and also plug them in the x equation like this so take fk1 and the second equation then write the first equation as t prime minus fk1 which is mu k Right? N1. Fn1 is M1g. That will be equal to M1a. Do the same thing for M2. T minus T prime minus Fk2, which is here, mu k, 
times Fn2, which is M2, G equals what? M2A. So what happened? Those six equations reduced to just two. Okay? We have two equations. Now, most of the time, uh, you will be given numbers for mu's and m's. And then the only unknowns will be the acceleration and the uh, tensions. Okay? Uh, you'll also be given uh, T because you're pulling the system, right? So you have T, you have mu, you have m's, and G is 9.8. So the uh, problem would be solve for, let's say, solve for the tension between the between the uh, objects, that's T prime, and uh, A, acceleration. Two, pro two unknowns, two equations. And you can solve them in any order. You can first solve T prime and then uh, use one of the equations to go to A. Or you can solve for A first by eliminating uh, T prime. And then once you obtain A, you can use it to find T prime. All right. So let me illustrate this with a, an example with numbers now. All right. But this is the outline. This is how you do it. All right. So let me pick um, a numerical example. And let's change it a little bit. Okay. Let's tweak it. So example. So here's an inclined plane. All right, and those two masses, M1 and M2, are here. Okay, connected with a rope. And this rope here goes over a pulley. There's a pulley here. And now hang, I'm hanging a third mass, which is going to provide me with its weight, the constant T that I was telling you about, right? So let's call this uh, capital M. This is M1. This is M2. All right. Now, um, this is an inclined plane. The previous one was a horizontal surface it had friction so we added one level of complexity in return let's take down one level of complexity let's ignore friction okay we don't have to but uh, let's just to make it just to make it uh, simpler ignore friction zero this is on ice let's say okay zero friction but let's use numbers this is 10 kilograms M2 is 2 kilograms, and M1 is 1 kilogram, zero friction. What about the inclination here? 25 degrees, let's say. Okay, problem. Find the tension find the tension In the ropes we have one here and one over there and also find the acceleration all right so let's mark the tension force here there's one here remember I always use a double arrow symbol you don't have to but it's it just uh, reminds you that whenever you isolate a certain part of the system the tension force has to be going outward so if I use double arrows here when I isolate let's say M2 here like this this reminds me that 
I have to consider these two uh, arrows to represent the tension forces as going outward, okay? Tension doesn't push, it pulls. Anyway, so that's the notation. So let's call this one uh, T2 and this one T1, like we did before, okay? And assuming a frictionless and uh, massless pulley, T2 is also here between the pulley and the large mass. Over here, we also have that same tension T2, okay? These two are the same throughout the rope because we're assuming a um, frictionless and massless pulley. All right, great. So we have three masses, all right? Can we write uh, three equations? Yes, we can. Means we have to apply Newton's second law three times to each mass. And when we do this, since we assumed zero friction, uh, we don't really have to worry about the normal force anymore. Because the friction, if, if present, would be a function of the normal force. Remember, mu times Fn. But friction is not present here. So let's not bother with the friction, uh, the normal force at all, which simplifies things. If I just take this direction, the positive x, for instance. This means for m1 and m2, when I'm writing the equations, I will not worry about what's happening in the y direction. So I will have just one equation for each mass. For m1, one equation. For m2, another equation, both in the x direction. And the third equation will be for uh, large m here. And I can take a... Why don't we make a change and call this y? for a change, okay? So downward is my positive y. All right? So let me draw the free body diagrams because it's already cluttered here. I'm just going to do it separately here. For m1, let's start with m1. These will be my regular uh, frames. I'm not worrying about y. I'm just going to put the positive x here. I'm going to represent m1 over here, okay, I placed M1 at the center of my uh, frame. What are the external forces acting on M1? Of course, T1 is pulling it in the positive x direction. I include that, T1, okay? Now, I know there is a normal force. I'm not going to bother finding it, but let me just put it here for completeness so you know what I'm talking about. Normal, by definition, is always perpendicular to the surface. So it is also in the same direction as the vertical here. All right, so that's normal force. I'm not going to write it. Let's say just normal force. Normal force. But the weight is what I have to include. Okay, weight always points downward, no matter how big the incline is, mg or m1g will point downward. Okay, so please do not draw any free body diagrams on which m1g points a direction other than downward. Okay, so I see sometimes people doing this. For m1, they draw a free body diagram like this where this is x. Of course, they rotate t1 and the normal force. But if you rotate this, then m1g will point that way, okay? I mean, mathematically, it's not wrong, but I don't want to see it on your papers, okay? Um, it doesn't help you either, because it's confusing. All right, but it's not wrong, but I don't want you to do it. Just rotate your coordinate frame and make sure your weight points downward. That's where Earth is, right? I mean, your pictures should be physical. So anyways, that M1G makes an angle with the axis here. That's equal to 25 degrees, okay? I'm not gonna go through again how to find that. that that's in other videos, but this is also 25 degrees, which means that if I complete this to a, a rectangle here, 
to use a rectangular chord. And that's, I will be actually using this side, side opposite to 25, which in return becomes this here, this side. That's nothing but the X component of the weight. Okay, so that will be M1G sine 25. M1G sine 25 is this. All right. And of course, there's the acceleration. A. It's a constant acceleration, okay? Why is it constant? Because as these masses move like that, Gravity doesn't change, okay? Very small distances are involved, so A is a constant. And it is in the X direction. There is no acceleration in the other direction here. There's no component there, okay? So that's for M1. Let's do quickly uh, M2 for M2 as well. Similarly, I'm using a tilted or rotated XY uh, frame x positive x is this direction this dot here represents m2 and then again i have m2g pointing downward with the 25 degree here there are two tensions that i have to consider t2 in the positive x direction and t1 now see what's happening here is always pointing away right so t1 is pointing in the negative x direction now and of course i have another normal force uh, normal force for M2 as well and A is pointing in the positive X direction finally the third mass the 10 kilogram mass I don't need to rotate my frame okay now this is my positive what uh, y direction but this is the large mass capital M now what are the forces acting on it of course it's weight its weight is pulling it downward earth is pulling it downward right so capital M times G what about T2 T2 is pulling it upward okay it's moving downward that has nothing to do with the direction of the rope, or the, the tension. The tension is always away from the object, remember? Whether the object is going up or down, doesn't matter. Okay, so that's T2 move, pointing in an up direction. Uh, what about the acceleration here? It's pointing in the positive Y direction, which is downward. As these objects go uphill, this one goes directly towards Earth. With what magnitude? With the same magnitude, because we're not talking about elastic cable, just regular cord. Same A, only pointing downward. Okay? So, those are the three free body diagrams. Now we can write down our equations. Okay? Remember, I only need three equations, because I'm not worrying about the perpendicular direction. So, from M1, what do I have? In the positive x direction, just T1. But in the negative x direction, I have M1G sine 25. So minus, it's negative, minus M1G sine 25. Okay? M is given, G is known, sine 25 you can find. So T1 is the unknown there, which has to be equal to mass times acceleration m1 times a and here's your second and good now from the uh, second free body diagram i have t2 in the positive x direction and t1 in the negative x direction therefore minus okay or in other words plus negative t1 if you will same thing about m2g m2g has a component along the negative x direction minus m2g sine 25 okay remember there is no friction in this problem so there is no friction term here if you have a friction force friction force and also inclined plane you have to include friction but then you have to worry about the um, perpendicular direction as well where you have to find normal force 
you know, and you have to consider the Y component of M1G, which will be with cosine, okay? It just adds more terms to your equations and more equations, if you will. Keep in mind. But here we have no friction. So T2 minus T1 minus M2G sine 25 is the net force in the X direction, which has to be equal to mass times acceleration. Which mass? M2. M2 times A. Okay? I need one more equation. At this point, you may say, if you know M1 and M2 and G, why are you not plugging them into your equations? I don't. Okay? I know that they are given. Those uh, numbers are 1 kilogram, 2 kilogram tank are given. I'm going to plug them in the end once I solve for, uh, or let's say, let me write the equations first and see what happens. But usually I like to leave it till the end, okay? I mean, I solve my equations algebraically in, in terms of letters, symbols, okay? And then the plugging in numbers is the last part where you just take your calculator and use it. The benefit of doing it like that is uh, when you're moving around numbers, okay, you make more mistakes. That's the, that's the reason. So the third equation that will come from the third free body diagram. Now see, the positive y direction I picked as downward, then mg has to go with a positive plus sign, right? mg. What will be negative? That is T2. So Mg minus T2 is the Y component of the net force, which is pointing downward. That has to be equal to capital M times A. Okay, the right hand side is always MA, some A, some M, I mean, you say have the same A, but use um, the mass you need there. All right, so these, from these three equations, you can solve for the three unknowns. What are they? T1, T2, and A, all right? So you solve these simultaneously. How do you do that? For instance, you can take the uh, third equation and uh, solve it for T2 in terms of A and plug it in the second equation. Okay, and you can do it in different ways. This is the first thing, you know, that uh, came to my mind. So, from the second equation here, T2 is equal to Mg minus Ma, right? That's a solution for T2. Take this T2 and plug it in the second equation. So, from these two equations now, I have mg minus ma which is t2 minus t1 minus m2 g sine 25 equals m2 a okay now you can forget about the third equation you only have two equations and two unknowns This is your first equation. From now on, you have to worry about this. And this is the second equation. Okay, because we got rid of T2. We're going to come back to that later. But the unknowns are A and T1. All right? Do the same trick. Or sim let's do a different trick now. Let's, let's add these equations. Add. Why do I add them? Because I see T1 here. I see negative T1. I know if I add them, adding means add the left hand side to the left hand side and right hand side together. T1s will cancel, right? So if I add them, let's see what happens. T1 minus M1G sine 25. That's the left hand side. And the left hand side here is MG minus MA minus T1 minus M2G sine 25 equals i'm going to write the i'm going to add the right hand sides now m1 a plus m2 a all right so this way i get rid of t1 i just have to solve for a 
all right now there is an a term over here on the left negative ma if i move it to the right it becomes positive ma and all three terms have a in them so i can factor a out so i will have m plus m1 plus m2 times a and everything on the left i can just uh, write them here so mg right mg minus m1g sine 25 degrees minus m2g sine 25 degrees finally divide everything by this total mass here to solve for acceleration so a will be this left hand side let me also write it as see i can factor uh, the uh, g's out or even g sine 25 you know so let's do it as mg minus here i'm going to write it as m1 plus m2 times g sine 25 okay or i can factor the g as well let's get rid of g here i'm going to write it at the end but divide this by m plus m1 plus m2 this times g okay now why do i write it like this because i like the fact that this thing in the parentheses is dimensionless you have mass in the numerator and mass in the denominator okay which cancel each other so you have a dimensionless number which means a is that dimensionless number times g right and that dimensionless number will always be less than one if you think about it i mean this cannot be faster than just a falling object right it has to have an acceleration less than g so this whole here constant is going to be a number less than one now we can plug in the numbers so a will be okay m was 10 kilograms minus m1 was what one right one kilogram plus two kilograms let's double check these uh one kilogram and two kilograms okay good all right times sine 25 Okay, the sine 25 only multiplies the 1 and 2 here, not 10. So make sure when you punch them in your calculator, you can use a parenthesis, uh, I guess, M, uh, 10 kilogram, 10 plus 1 plus 2. All right, so this times G. Well, G is 9.8. This times 9.8 or 9.81 meters per second square. Okay, so I'm taking my calculator now. I'm just calculating this factor here. So 10 minus 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 sine 25. Okay, equals... 8.73 divided by 13 so 0 0.67 0 0.67 times g times 9.8 is equal to 6.58 meters per second square okay now look at this uh result here before we plugged in the numbers we ended up with this result here right now let's think about this result for a second now we obtained this through many steps the steps involved drawing free body diagrams in a clever way you know clever meaning you don't have to worry about the y direction or the perpendicular direction and then uh, writing out the newtonian 
Newton's second uh, formula, second law, and then ending up with three equations and then doing some mathematical simple tricks. And I mean, it took like 10 minutes, right? But just look at the formula. Could I achieve this even faster than that? What do I have here? I have mg and I have m1 plus m2 sine 25 and divided by this total mass here. See, m plus m1 plus m2. Everything added, all the mass is added here. So it's as if I'm looking at the system here, okay? It's like a train with many cars, okay? When the train moves, you don't really have to worry about always the, the, the connection between the cars and the forces there. Um, the, the, the train, I mean, there, there could be like 100 masses like this connected with ropes, okay? Do we really have to worry about the tension between each rope unless they ask us? You know, we don't have to worry about it. So you can treat this as a system, like a train moving with the same acceleration as a whole. Whole meaning the total mass. 1 plus 2 plus 10, 13 kilogram mass moving, okay? So let's go back to the result. Now, if you look at this result carefully, all right? So this in the denominator was over here before we divided it. So the total mass times the acceleration, right? It's still the Newton's law, right? Newton's second law. The mass of the system times this acceleration. So what do we have on the left-hand side then? We have three terms, mg, m1g sine 25, m2g sine 25. Now, think about it. Why is this system moving in the first place? Because Earth is pulling it, right? Now, Earth's pull happens in three ways because we have three masses and the large mass is pulled directly downward. That's why we have mg there. But the other terms represent Earth's pull or its projection along the inclined plane, which involves the sine 25 term, okay? So if you get, when you get experience with these, you know, you can write this equation directly down, okay? Without even bothering with all the free body diagrams and all. But that requires some experience, but I hope you, this doesn't make sense, okay? This equation itself, you know, when you get used to these problems, this equation can be written directly from Newton's second law, considering these things that I just told you, okay? Just to keep in mind. But this is the formal way of how you solve it. Now, in this mathematical approach, I solved for A first, okay? Is it the only way? No, if you go back to the beginning, you have three unknowns, T1, T2, and A. You know, maybe one of you would like to solve for T1 first. It's okay, mathematically possible, right? But since I solved for A first, and actually I made this point about the Newton's second law here, let's keep going. Once we have A, 6.58 meters per second square. I can take that number and then plug it in the equations to solve for T1 and T2. Like I could use uh, the first equation over here, right? This one. Let's use this to solve for T1. Because I know what A is now. So T1 is equal to M1A plus M1G sine 25, right? So it is equal to M1 times uh, A plus G sine 25. Okay, so M1 is 1 kilogram. A is 6.58. What was it? 6.58 meters per second square plus 9.8 meters per second square times sine 25, right? Just simply plug in those. So 6.58 plus 9.8 times sine 25. That gave me 10.7. 
or 10.72 10.7 newtons all right done finally t2 okay you can use this equation here solve for t2 now t2 will be equal to m times what uh, g minus a so 10 kilograms and g is 9.8 meters per second square minus uh, 6.58 meters per second square all right so 9.8 minus 6.58 3.22 times 10 32.2 Newtons. Okay, I hope I did the uh, math part here correct. You can check those numbers. I mean, it's just a matter of uh, solving for the unknowns with the system, uh, within the system of uh, equations. All right, so that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. Um, well, let's use friction now. Let's use just two masses. An inclined plane, or how about two inclined planes like this? All right, so uh, let's pick a surface. Okay, this is the example two. Let this be 40 degrees. And this is 45, let's say. All right, I have a mass on the left. Which is uh, five kilograms. And a mass on the right. M2, 12 kilograms. Okay, I picked something larger. I'm going to connect these two with a rope that goes over a pulley and the pulley is again massless and frictionless so I don't have to worry about the change in the tension there's only one T in the system T on left and right hand sides T has the same value okay now as you can guess uh, the system will move okay like m2 is heavier okay and it's a steeper angle also 45 you know so you expect m2 to go downhill and m1 to go uphill now can you predict this in all problems what if the masses were close and the angle you can tell okay um like what if uh 12 were on the left hand side and five was on the right but instead of 45, you had 65, okay? I mean, on top of your head, you may not be able to tell which direction it's going to move. No big deal. You pick a direction, write down your equations, and solve them. If you find a negative acceleration in the end, this means your initial choice was wrong. You just flip the direction and say, okay, this is actually the direction it has to go, right? So that's not a big deal. But in this problem, I think it's obvious that M1 is going to go uphill, and M2 is going to go downhill. So this is the acceleration direction here and over here. It's like that. But for this problem, let's also have friction. All right. So friction. We're talking about the kinetic friction here. Let's say 0 0.1. Okay. Is the friction force between those masses and the surface. If I wanted, I could make it even more complicated by introducing different friction coefficients. You know, maybe the those boxes are made of different materials. Okay, but let's not do that. You know, we gotta. Uh, we don't need to make it that complicated. Let's just solve for it. Solve for acceleration and solve for the tension. Find a and t. This is our problem. The masses are given. The friction coefficient given, the angles are given, what are the acceleration and tension? Okay, 
Free body diagrams. We need to Now here is your M1. Okay, I'm going to pick the positive x direction as this one. Cuz I know it's moving in that direction, okay? So M times A, M times A will be positive if I do that, just to make it simple. Um, I can do the same trick on the right hand side for the uh, free body diagram for the second one. If I pick this as my positive x direction, I will end up with a positive ma, right? So this is a here, this is a over there. So this is the y direction. Here, this is the y direction. I need y in this problem because there's friction involved, okay? So let's mark the forces. Let's start with weight. That never goes away. M1g downward. This T here, if you isolate this mass, is pointing away from the object. So this is T. And of course, we have the normal force. Fn, or how about I just call it N, N for normal, N1. Okay. And for the second mass, M2. Oh, I forgot the friction. There's also friction here. Y to the left or downhill because it's moving up, right? It has to oppose that. So F, kinetic friction, F1. Now M2, um, and of course the angle here is 40 degrees. 40 degrees. Now for M2, of course we have uh, the weight, M2G. Now T. Be careful, T is pulling it in the negative x direction. Okay, if you isolate this, T is here, pulling it in that direction. What about friction? Well, friction is also in the same direction. F2, right? Both friction and the tension point in the negative x direction. We have the normal force, which I'm going to just call N2. Okay, is that it? Well, you have to include the angle, 45. All right. Now be careful to pick the right angle for 45. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but 40, you know, it would be a mistake to call this one 40, for instance. Okay, so make sure you've got your geometry right. Now, a very common mistake at this point some people will add a force here. Hey, I have an acceleration. So there must be a force there. F. I see it all the time. Okay. You don't do that. All right. That force, I mean, if you're, think, if you're thinking in terms of the net force, yeah, the net force isn't along the A, but you don't put here. Okay. You don't show that. The net force is the sum of these four forces, N2, M2G, F2, and T. If you add them up, you get the net force, which will indeed be in the direction of A, but you do not show it on free body diagram, okay? So that would be a terrible mistake to include a fifth force here, okay? You don't do that. Same thing for the first one. So we're done with the free body diagrams. Let's just um, write down our equations. Remember, we have to include what's happening in the y direction this time. So we'll end up with more equations. So for the first free body diagram, I have T minus F1 equals minus, I'm sorry, T minus F1 minus M1G sine 4D. M1G sine 4D. That is the x component of the net force along the x direction equals m1a. In the y direction, I have n1 positive and m1g cosine 40. Why cosine? Because that's adjacent to 40. m1g cosine 40 equals what? Zero, because acceleration has a zero component, zero y component. And finally, F1 is by definition mu k times 
N1, normal force. Done. M2, same thing. Now, what's happening in the x direction? We have M2G sine 45, right? The x component of M2G, it's pointing in the positive x direction, therefore positive. What will be negative? F2 and T. Those will be negative, equal to M2 times A. Along the y direction, we have N2 minus M2G cosine 45 equals 0. Right? There's no acceleration in the y direction. That's why we picked a rotated frame. That's the whole idea behind rotating your coordinate frame is to eliminate one of the components of the acceleration vector just to make life easier. If you use a regular XY, you can still solve it. You can still do it. It won't be wrong. It could be more complicated because you, have, you will have AX and AY, right? So that's your second equation. And of course, we have F2 equals mu2 times the normal force by definition. I'm sorry, mu k. I didn't say mu2. I didn't mean to say mu2. I meant mu k. All right, now we can solve uh, these for a and t. That's the problem, right? Find a and t. Let's do the same trick of uh, getting rid of the friction and the normal force. So this, this system will be reduced into just into two equations. The first one will be T minus F1, which is, <coughs> excuse me, mu K times N1, which is M1G cosine 40, keep going, minus M1G sine 40 equals M1A. <coughs> Right hand side, same trick, M2G sine 45 minus F2, therefore minus mu k times N2, which is M2G cosine 45. Keep going, minus T equals m2a okay so the problem is only solving two equations simultaneously let's do that trick of adding t's again it works if it works it works okay you don't have to think too hard just do the first thing that comes to your mind i see t here i see negative t I'm going to add the, these two, get rid of T, right? So if I do that, I will have M1 plus M2 times A on the right-hand side. Let me, let me write it to the left. M1 plus M2, right, times A. Now, if I, get, if I add these two, I get rid of T's, what is left? I have now... Um, M2G sine 45 minus the other terms, okay? So M2G sine 45 minus mu k M2G cosine 45 minus M1G sine 45 and minus mu k m1g cosine 40. So if I solve this for a and maybe simplify it by factoring out uh, g's and uh, such, so this will be equal to m2 sine 45, 
There's also sine 245 here as well, which is M1. So why don't I uh, include that here? So M1 plus M2. I'm sorry, M2 minus M1. Okay, I gotta be careful. M2 minus M1 times sine 45, which takes care of the first and the third terms. Now keep going. I have the second and the fourth terms, which involve mu k g cosine 45. Okay, I'm going to add g at the end, but minus m1 plus m2. All right, mu k cosine 45. These all divided by m1 plus m2 times g. All right. Okay, so think about this. What's happening here? We have <clears throat> gravity doing its thing. The difference of the masses, m2 and m1. Remember, m2 was the heavy one. That difference is deriving this motion, so that's why I have m2 minus m1 sine 45 because it has to be projected onto the plane. But the friction is opposing it, that's why I'm subtracting that friction term here. And the friction for the friction, I have m1 plus m2, not minus, because for both masses, friction is in the other direction that is moving, right? So it's opposing it, okay? And then this whole thing here will be a dimensionless number again. Just a number less than g. A number, I'm sorry, less than 1. Less than 1, so that a will be less than g, okay? So if you have this answer, and it makes sense, right, for the reasons that I told you earlier, this is just the application of Newton's second law, you can plug in the numbers. That's all you have to do. So M2 was 12. I'm not going to write the units to save space. Uh, so M2 was 12 and M1 was 5. Okay, I made a little mistake here. Cosine 45, sine 45. Actually, one of them is 40. When I carried out this, I made a mistake somewhere, so... Okay, so let me fix that, okay? Sine 40, cosine 40, sine 45, cosine 45. Okay, so when I'm grouping these, I cannot factor cosines and sines, so sorry about that. Let me just do it again. Okay. Okay, let's check this equation. M2G sine 45, fine. M mu K M2G cosine 45, that's also okay. This is G. But this is 40. M1G sine 40, so that's the mistake. This is 40. And also the fourth term cosine 40 that's fine okay so all right so we just have to plug numbers I mean, there's not much we can do so m2 we can factor g out if you will so m2 sine 45 minus m1 sine 40 not 45 Minus um, mu k, okay, m2 cosine 45, and here I have uh, m1, m1 cosine 40. Okay, you divide this by m1 plus 
M2 and then multiply by G. Okay, this is the, this is how you do it. All right, so let's plug in the numbers now. M2 was 12, M1 was uh, 5. Okay, I'm just going to plug in the numbers and mu k is 0 0.1. So, M2, 12, sine 45, minus 5, sine 40, minus 0 0.1 times open parentheses, M2, 12, cosine 45, plus M1, 5, cosine 40, close parentheses, and divide by M1 plus M2, 5 plus 12. Okay, so... Okay, I made a mistake somewhere. I got 5.19. This has to be less than uh, less than 1. Let's do it again. M2, 12 sine 45, minus 5 sine 40, okay, minus 0 0.1, M2 cosine 45, plus M1, 5 cosine 40, divided by 5 plus 12. Hmm. Oh, of course, I forgot the parentheses. Sorry, sorry. So let's go back and this. 4.039 divided by 5 plus 12. 0 0.237, let's say 0 0.24. This thing here becomes 0 0.24 times G, or 0 0.2376 times 9.8. So A is uh, 2.32 or 2.33. 2.33 meters per second square. Okay, that's our A. We have our A, what will be T, you go back to uh, this equation here, or this one, doesn't matter, Each, either one of them. Let's use the first one. Okay, let's change colors. So here, taking this equation now, solve for T. Solve for T. T will be equal to M1A plus mu K M1 G mu K cosine 40 plus sine 40. times M1 G. Okay, so T is equal to M1A plus mu K cosine 40 M1 G plus M1 G sine 40. Okay, so let's plug in the numbers now. M1 was 5 kilograms and A is uh, 2.33. 2.33 plus mu k is 0 0.1 cosine 40 plus sine 40 okay and uh, this times 9.8 alright so 0 0.1 cosine 40 plus sine 40 0 0.719 times 9.8 plus 
times 5, that gives me 46.9 newtons. Please check this again. But that's your tension. All right, so. I mean, this problem has everything in it, both friction and inclined plane. Let's solve one from the book. Okay, end of chapter problems. Let's do number 22. Now, in the previous two examples, I just solved for tension and acceleration. I didn't really include kinematics with it. I could if I wanted. What do I mean by that? Like in the previous example, when you had this system here of two masses connected with a rope, we know it was accelerating, right? Now I could say, okay, a time later, this mass will come, come down here, and this mass over here will be up there, okay? Of course, this means some displacement. So you could involve uh, delta x, initial and final velocities, time, okay? You could include those as well. I don't want to make it too complicated, but, um, it was possible. Actually, this problem here, number 22, I think it has something like that. Let's see what it says. Number 22. Uh, two blocks are connected by an ideal cord that passes over a frictionless pulley. So the two masses, M1, connected to M2 over a massless and frictionless pulley. M1 is 3.6 kilograms and M2 is 9.2, heavier. By the way, this is called Atwood's machine. Atwood's machine. Okay, this problem is called Atwood's machine. And block two is initially at rest. Initially at rest, so V2 initial is zero. Well, if block two is at rest initially, this means block one is also initially at rest. V1 initial is also zero. And uh, block two, at the rest, uh, 140 centimeters above the floor. So there's the floor here. Initially, it is 140 centimeters above. Initially. Okay, how long does it take block two to reach the floor? So initially at t equals zero, what will be t when m2 comes here? Of course, m1 will go somewhere up. Okay, not somewhere, it's gonna be actually 140 centimeters above the original. Right, whatever the position is, it's going to be 140 centimeters above because M2 is going down. One is going up, the other one is going down. Okay, so what will be the time? They're asking for time. So we need to find... What? What do you think we need to find? Tension? No, we don't need tension. We need acceleration. We need to find acceleration because we have 
the kinematics formula is where when a is a constant again a will be a number less than 9.8 we we've seen that before because it's two masses moving in opposite directions once you find a you can find t all right so let's remember before we find a let's remember the equations of kinematics when acceleration is constant remember um, we had two equations for the displacement and for this problem let's pick uh, down as our positive x direction so the two equations that I'm talking about is number one delta x equals we have the average velocity here meaning uh, v initial plus v final divided by 2 times t okay delta x is displacement it also given as can be given as um, v initial times t plus one half a t squared okay i'm just remembering the basic equations of kinematics two of which are those and then we have the final velocity in terms of the initial velocity and acceleration and time and finally we had the fourth equation without time let me just write it here vi squared plus 2a delta x now the first equation doesn't have a in it so scratch it the fourth equation has a in it but there's no t so we don't worry about that either okay and we don't know the final velocity either so why worry about the third equation actually we just need this one the second one right vi is um, zero for both so suppose you apply this equation to m2 here there's not even a term here that we have to worry about because it's zero we just use this one half at squared okay delta x is given if you find a you can solve for t easily all right that's what we're going to do we're going to solve for a and then find t from it all right so now going back to newton's second law application of newton's second law with these free body diagrams now m1 and m2 is what we have m2 is pulled down by m2g and pulled up by tension m1 is also pulled up by tension and pulled down by m1g so what is different well m1 is accelerating upward and m2 is accelerating downward that's the difference all right so when we write the second law here we will say if I pick uh, this to be my positive x and this as my positive x for the second one just one equation for each so t minus m1g equals m1a from the first equation and from the second equation m2g minus t equals m2a again if I add these two I will get m2 minus m1 g equals m1 plus m2 a therefore a is equal to m2 minus m1 divided by m1 plus m2 times g all right so m2 was 9.2 m1 is uh, 3.6 so you plug those in 
and 9.8 for G. So we find 9.2 minus 3.6 divided by 9.2 plus 3.6, 0 0.4375 times 9.8. I got 4.2829, 4.29 meters per second square. Okay, so I take this equation now, delta x is equal to one half a T squared. I mean, the, the initial term is gone because it's zero. Therefore, T, if you solve for this, 2 times delta x divided by A, and you take the square root. So this gives you 2 times, okay, 140 centimeters means 1.4 meters, right? 140 centimeters is 1.4 meters. Why do I do that? Because I want to find t in seconds. If I leave it in centimeters, the answer will not be in seconds. The units should be in standard units. MKS, meters, kilograms, seconds. So A will be, of course, in meters per second square, 4.29 meters per second square. Right, meters go away, one over second square. I mean, 1 over 1 over second square, second square, take the square root, just seconds. So, this is equal to 2.8 divided by 4.29, and take the square root, 0 0.807 or 8, 0 0.808 seconds, okay? So it takes 0 0.808 seconds for M2 to reach the floor. Same thing, M1 reaches a point 140 centimeters above the floor, above the original position. Okay, that's called Atwood's machine. So this was an example from the book. So you get the idea, I guess. Um, there's also the notion of apparent weight. Okay, so before I talk about uh, projectile motion, let me mention apparent weight. Okay, suppose you are in an elevator. Okay, and here's a bathroom scale. and you're standing on it. All right, so what number are you gonna read? Is it gonna be your regular weight that you know, or is it gonna be different? Well, that depends on what the accelerator is doing. What the elevator, I'm sorry, what the elevator is doing. This is the elevator. Okay, so if the elevator is accelerating, as an A, that's when you have this apparent weight, okay? So, the number you see on the screen, on the dial, will not be mg, that's what we're talking about. Normally, anyways, what, what do you see when you sit or when you stand up, uh, when, you, when, you are, when you get on top of a bathroom scale? That number you read actually is nothing but the normal force, okay? I mean, the you push it downward, it pushes you back. So it's the normal force, really. Right, so let's uh, think about it. You have the bathroom scale. Oops. And then here's you. You push against the scale. In return, it pushes you up. 
which we call the normal force, right? Now, when you're doing it in your bathroom, this normal force is your weight. Okay? But when you're doing it in an elevator, N and Mg, are they equal to each other? Okay, that's the question. So if the elevator is accelerating, this means you and the scale are also accelerating with it, okay? Whether, whether you are aware of it or not, doesn't matter. You are accelerating with respect to a person who is watching it from outside, okay? So if you are accelerating, your free body diagram here will require an A vector pointing up. Okay, so if you apply Newton's second law to you, okay, what are the forces acting on you? There are N, normal force, and Mg. N is pointing up, Mg is pointing down. That's not equal to zero anymore. That's equal to M times A. Now the elevator could be moving up or down, or accelerating upward or downward. Or it could be moving upward, but slowing down. Okay? If it's moving up, but slowing down, means acceleration vector is actually pointing downward. Okay? So this is one possibility. Another possibility. N and Mg are still like this, but A is pointing down. This is slowing down. This is speeding. Okay? I mean, don't get me wrong. Both actually moving upward. The velocity vector is pointing up. When velocity is parallel to A, you're speeding up. When A is in the, in the opposite direction, when V and A are anti-parallel, you're slowing down. But the point is, this will change the uh, equation here. Now you will have n minus mg equals m times negative a, or if you will, mg minus n equals ma. Okay, so keep that in mind. But the bottom line is, n is not equal to mg. Remember, n Normal force is what you read on the scale. That's your apparent weight. Okay? So when you're speeding up, the first case, N becomes MA plus MG. So MA, MG plus MA. Right? Or M times G plus A. So you'll see a number there which is actually greater than your ag actual weight. All right, and if you're slowing down, the opposite thing happens. And here is mg minus ma. Therefore, the number you read on the scale will be less than your actual weight. Okay, if you are not accelerating, no matter how fast the elevator is, you'll always read the uh, number, correct number, your correct weight on the scale, okay? So the value of the speed has no nothing to do with it. It's the acceleration, all right? If there is no acceleration, it doesn't matter if it's slow or fast. Your apparent weight will be your actual weight. Okay, so that's all. So... Um, if the passenger here doesn't realize that the elevator is accelerating, is it possible? Yeah, of course it's possible. I mean, uh, an elevator, um, is made of uh, mechanical parts, okay? If you can reduce friction and sound and things like this, you may not know, I mean, that you are um, speeding up but you may still feel heavy, right? I mean, uh, 
let me put it this way. Let's say this elevator is in space, okay? And the value of the acceleration is exactly 9.8, okay? And it's moving up. Or you're moving in a direction with the elevator and you you will feel that. You will be, you. it's like you're pushed against the other wall of the elevator, okay? But if the A is exactly, uh, if A is exact 9.8, you may also think that, hey, maybe I'm not in space, outer space. Maybe I am still on Earth on a stationary uh, enclosure, right? So you can't tell, really. There's no way of telling whether it's the acceleration or gravity that is causing um, that effect, that you are pushed against one of the walls of the room. Okay, so that's the equivalence principle. Uh, it could be both. I mean, if it's happening on the Earth, um, every time you get on the elevator, you know, you will feel it. If you're going from the first floor to the 10th floor, you may not feel it, you know, in, when you are on the floors between 2 and 9. But when you are at the first and the last floor, you will feel it. You will feel that change okay or god forbid if the elevator is falling freely and you are falling in it you know you will experience weightlessness right as if you are in outer space because you're falling and everything around you is falling with the same rate you know for that short time of one or two seconds you may feel uh, <clears throat> weightlessness you still have weight okay weight never goes away but uh you will have that experience of weightlessness. All right, so that's apparent weight. I mean, uh, later when we do uh, circular motion, we're gonna come back to this, okay? So, um, in sci-fi movies and books, you have uh, circular space stations, like a giant loop, which actually spins. Okay. Now we're gonna do it in detail, but um, if it's just spinning, rotating about an axis, there's also an acceleration vector involved, even if you don't change your speed there's still acceleration that points to the center which could be utilized to create artificial gravity for a space station if you rotate at the right speed so we're going to come back to this idea of apparent weight later the final topic i want to talk about today is um, projectile motion let's check time okay so it's been one hour and 43 minutes. Let's do this. Let me stop this video and start another one. And that will, video will be about projectile motion. Okay, so I'm gonna stop this now. And I'll meet you again in the second video.